There is a public venue uh, focusing on Southeast Asia, all kind of issue related to Southeast Asia, and our aim is to reach a general public, and this is why we are inside the Bangkok Arts and Culture Center. A lot of these places normally are in university or other place where only certain people go, but we hope in this way that the more general public is also reached, and we do a lot of exhibition also for this purpose. And so today we are going to launch uh, what I believe is quite an important exhibition because it shows uh, the issue of informal settlement on the Thai-Myanmar border uh, following the conflict and uh, junta since February uh, 2020. And uh, we also want to show that it's not a new problem. So some of the photographs in the exhibition actually are about the refugee camp. Uh, the main one, Menla, is there. And we want to show that this already 30 years more, there are people, refugees from Myanmar and Thailand, still living in isolation in the camp. So it's not a new issue. Unfortunately, it repeats over the time, and we don't have good solution. We have people living in this informal settlement, or the camp is not the solution to uh, these people fleeing conflict. But we will hear now from an expert on this issue, Patrick. So he will first give a kind of overview of the situation, and then we will let the photographer uh, talk about their work. So Patrick is with 45 rights, and I think he's with the media, right? You are? Your position? Oh, my position is uh, human rights advocacy specialist. Okay, so please. Thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and Fortify Rights to be here today. I'm afraid I'm recovering from a slight head cold, so if I sound a bit croaky, then you'll know why. But I have checked, and it's not COVID, so you're all safe. Um, <laughs> I work for Fortify Rights. We're a regional human rights organization. Um, not entirely based here, but we've actually just opened up a, a co-working space that I invite you to, uh, to, to have a look at. It's called the Fort, and it's in Jim Hong Kong. Um, but no, we're, we're, we're officially based in Geneva and the United States, but many staff are based here and across the region. Um, my position is, is, as I said, human rights advocacy specialist, so I'm involved in getting our reports, our investigations out into the public, out doing these kinds of events, meeting with journalists, meeting with the um, our, our work covers three main, uh, three main problems, you know, like investigating human rights abuses, engaging uh, people in positions of power to make change and strengthening local responses to human rights abuses. So just a broad overview of, of what Fortify Rights does in, um, in our work. Uh, so as was already said, um, there are officially uh, 91,400 refugees, Myanmar refugees, in nine camps uh, along the Thai the Myanmar border. Um, there are also 5,150 refugees outside of the camps kind of classically known as urban refugees. They, they come from a variety of different nationalities. And due to Thailand's uh, quite flexible immigration, well not flexible, but quite uh, easy, it's quite easy to come to Thailand through various means. Um, it does attract um, refugees and asylum seekers from multiple locations. Um, however, since uh, every first attempted coup d'etat in, in Myanmar, a further 17,000 I believe to have crossed into Thailand from Myanmar, single to safety. Um, that's likely to be a vast underestimation of the total figure of Myanmar people uh, who have crossed over since the coup. Um, and that's coming from the fact that it's politically, um, in, uh, politically dangerous for, for the Thai government to actually count and quantify the amount of people who have come over here. Um, and that political calculation comes into everything that the Thai government does in terms of its uh, treatment of, of the refugees coming from, from Myanmar. Since the coup, um, we can say that out of that 17,000, let's just stick with the official figure, um, there are two main groups. Um, one group that are coming from the um, largely rural uh, borderlands, uh, the states that border Thailand, so uh, Karen State, Karen East State, Shan State. Um, and these people are largely rural, 
Karen and Karen villages. Um, and then the second large group are um, CEOs, so people who have gotten involved with the civil disobedience movement uh, against the, the attempted coup d'etat. Um, they're human rights defenders who have been persecuted by the winter. Um, they're civil society. Um, they are journalists um, and, and others who have been targeted for persecution. So with that first group, um, what has happened with that first group is there's been intermittent but quite uh, significant violence in both Karen and Kareni states uh, since the coup. Um, and so that has forced villagers to seek safety on, on, on this side of the border. Um, Thai security forces have housed these refugees in what they're calling temporary safety areas, um, but they have not allowed UNHCR or other aid agencies access to these safety areas. So it's very um, questionable uh, how these safety areas have been run, what aid has been given to these refugees, what kind of protection screening mechanisms, if any, have been put in place by the Thai authorities. Um, and it generally doesn't align with international uh, best practice when it comes to handling refugee situation, that's for sure. Uh, we've also documented uh, breaches of international law in handling refugees in Thailand. So uh, forced return, no under international law and reform law, has happened very regularly with this situation. So in April 2021, we documented at least 2,000 Myanmar refugees being forced back over uh, the river uh, into back into Karen State. Um, then just uh, last week, I think it was the end of September, yes, um, there was another group of Karen villagers who were actually filmed this time being forced back. So the Thai authorities regularly breach the international legal principle of uh, non reform uh, which is really a key principle in terms of handling refugees and people who are fearing uh, for their safety. So what we've got now along the border is a kind of endless state of ping-ponging of these people back and forth uh, over, the, over the, the river that divides Myanmar and Thailand. Um, this policy, I think, is, is informed by a few different things. Political considerations uh, is certainly uh, part of it uh, in terms of Thailand's uh, relations with the junta in Myanmar. Um, I think also it's informed by the history of the nine camps, actually, and, and the fact that Thailand has hosted a pretty sizable refugee population for the best part of 40 years now. Um, and, and they really want to avoid having this situation again with these most recent refugees. So they really are keen on not letting these people stay in Thailand. Um, now, the situation for the, the, the urban dwellers, the CEMs, the journalists, the civil society actors, is, is quite different. Um, so they were persecuted, they were targeted for persecution within the uh, because of their activism, because of their resistance to the military takeover. Um, and now, and then, you know, when they were, when their homes were raided, when their relatives were killed, when their, uh, their friends and, and, and colleagues were, were targeted, they obviously, uh, you know, saw no other option but to uh, flee uh, their homes and, uh, and their families and come to Thailand. Um, has always been the closest kind of um, place of safety for them. Now, they, they often were smuggled across um, the borders, so there's quite, a, a, quite a, a, an active network of smugglers that are involved in, in that trade, um, and they are charging a good amount for each person to come across into, on, uh, on, onto uh, Thai territory. Um, so, um, but then when they are here in Thailand, it's not like this is, you know, the land of milk and honey and then finally they have their freedoms restored, you know, quite the opposite, in fact. Because Thailand's laws um, and policies um, criminalize, actually criminalize seeking refugee status in Thailand, um, that leads them to live a life in the shadows, under constant fear of uh, extortion, uh, arbitrary arrest and detention and forced return uh, back to a really unknown fate in, in the hands of the, of the hunter authorities. Um, so you now you have a pretty large, large population uh, in Mersan and in other uh, cities along, towns and cities along the border 
um, who are, you know, in a legal black hole. They have no status on the title. They have no protection. They have no access to public services. Their children have no access to schooling, healthcare. Um, and that leads uh, them into the situation where there's actually a pretty serious prospect of human trafficking as well, because they're getting increasingly desperate. They've run through their savings. Um, the Myanmar economy has, has tanked, and so their family aren't able to send them uh, resources anymore as well. So they're desperate, they're looking for employment, and they don't have legal status. That combination is really uh, a deadly combination that, that, that we've seen you know, replicated throughout the world that leads people into uh, modern slavery. So that's a prospect that's really up and coming, uh, I think, with uh, the latest uh, influx of Myanmar refugees to Thailand. It's also just a, a wastage of human potential. Um, I've met many uh, Myanmar people from that group of cities. Many of them are well-educated professionals who have a lot to contribute to both Myanmar and, and, and Thailand. Uh, and, and it's a real shame that that contribution isn't being allowed to be made. I'll just finish off with a couple of um, a flagging a couple of recent legal uh, developments that we're watching at Fortify Rights. Um, and that may prove to uh, be part of the answers, at least, to um, some of the problems that I've raised. Um, one is Thailand recently passed the anti-torture uh, legislation that has been talking about passing for a long time. And Article 13 of that legislation actually um, puts into Thai law um, the special legal principle of non-reform, of not sending people back to places where they they face persecution and torture. Um, and so I think the Thai lawyers should be making note of that, and hopefully cases will be brought under that legislation uh, once it's enacted um, to prevent the kind of force return that we saw last week. Um, and the second piece of legislation that, um, well, it's not legislation, in fact, it, it's, a, it's a regulation. It's the national screening mechanism. It's the, um, Thailand is basically trying to bring refugee status determination processes that are traditionally done by the UN in house. They try to domesticate that. They built their own system and um, that will provide, or that is envisioned to provide um, what they call protected person status to individuals who, who do face likely persecution or torture. This has been in the works for since 2019 and um, there's been quite a few different versions of the uh, standard operating procedures that will govern this screening mechanism. Many of them, actually all of them so far, have been under, under, internet, uh, under international standards in terms of uh, refugee protection. So we, uh, we don't hold that much hope for this national screening mechanism, but maybe it's a start. Um, and just to finish, uh, you know, some of our recommendations that we're putting to the Thai government is to really end this policy of forced returns. It's putting lives at risk. Um, it's against international law, and it doesn't make Thailand look good on the international stage at all, especially as it's applying for human rights council status uh, currently. Uh, secondly, we would like the Thai government to grant immediate temporary protective status to, to Myanmar refugees surviving since February 1st, 2020. Um, under Thai law, it's already a possibility for the Prime Minister to grant temporary protective status to whole groups of refugees in Thailand. And he should take up that legislation and use that legislation to provide these people who really don't have an option to go home to have a legal status in Thailand. And then with that legal status, allow them to have access to basic public services, allow them access to the, uh, the labor market, because Thailand needs laborers, and these people need work, and they need le legal, safe work. Otherwise, you're going to be facing a situation of huge human trafficking, um, which is adding to an already existing, very significant problem in Thailand. Uh, and finally, Thailand really hasn't been particularly conducive in terms of its stance towards the Myanmar Junta. Actually, it's very, very close to the Myanmar Junta, um, whereas other ASEAN nations have been signaling that what the, what the Junta is doing in Myanmar is not acceptable and action needs to be taken, whereas the Thai government has been delaying the, uh, uh, and putting roadblocks in the way to progress, real progress inside Myanmar. So Thailand really does need to work with other ASEAN partners now to, to end this crisis, to, to isolate the Junta, to stop arms from the regional Junta, to stop uh, buying 
gas and oil from the winter uh, and, to, uh, and to work with the legitimate government of the Myanmar and the So I'll leave it there. Let's get to it right away in case uh, for everyone to come. Thank you for uh, this overview and also recommendation about how to improve uh, the situation. Now we go to the photographers and we start with, uh, and we want to start now. So he is the one who came to us first with these uh, photos of refugees and then we look for other photographs to give an even more comprehensive image of what is happening. So please. So, uh, Thanks to uh, thanks Southeast Asia Junction, the ACC, and everyone here. Uh, my name is Al Maxo, you, you can call me Al. Um, well, born and raised in Yangon, uh, being based in Thailand for uh, like 18 months, I think. Um, so, I'm uh, that I already share a lot of information, uh, a lot of useful information and recommendations as well. So, here I'm going to tell some stories, because I'm a storyteller. So, um, so I think, uh, to be honest, I didn't prepare this speech, so everything is coming from here. <laughs> uh, maybe this is also like an excuse as well. <laughs> um, well, so, first, uh, I want to say, uh, before the coup in Myanmar, in January, uh, myself and Jen as well and Zinko, there is another photographer uh, whose photos are exhibited here. Uh, but he is not here today for some personal reasons. So he was uh, doing a photography workshop for uh, disabled children like, who cannot uh, speak or cannot hear. So he believed that um, like photography can you know, help them to create something they love. So it was just a few days after the coup. Um, uh, we all were infamous, you know, uh, Zinko was also, of course, infamous, you know. So, but, but he had a plan uh, to do an exhibition with the image of all these children uh, after the workshop. Uh, but before we ended the workshop, there was a coup. So we had to cancel uh, this photography workshop for uh, some disabled children and the exhibition didn't happen. So Zinko had a message for all of you guys. Uh, so all these photos exhibited today and his works are dedicated to those uh, disabled children in Nengo. Uh, and uh, like you see, like, uh, maybe you might have some questions like, um, uh, like why I'm a hero, you know, why I'm not in Diego, you know, uh, or like since I'm a journalist, a photographer, like I can be targeted or something like that. But I want to highlight that um, the whole country has been under the risk, you know, not only you or me or a journalist or an individual, the whole country has been under the risk. You know, and Thailand is the most easiest option for us to come out, you know, and it has a lot of resources, you know, and the prices are not very different. But still, several millions of people inside the country and along the border are suffering. But we are so grateful for our uh, current situation uh, right now uh, in, in Thailand. Although uh, we have uh, so many, we face so many difficulties as well. Uh, but in general, we have much, much better life, much safer situation than uh, uh, than people inside Yuma or or along the border. You know, uh, if you exhibited like a, a photo like this, or like uh, criticize something like against the military, like it, it might be your last day in your life, you know. So I don't know how to describe all those atrocities uh, uh, committed uh, by the military, but it is already at the end. Like, they are already at the end of the road. And also I feel like Myanmar is now forgotten. Like people kind of forgot about us, you know. 
like there is no enough attention in like Myanmar case. I don't know how to respond. I mean, there are many research papers, uh, many experts along the border, many uh, many organizations along the border, but there is no action. Like there is no uh, international support. Uh, there is no campaigns. You know, there is no recognition. You know, like we are heartbroken. Like every single people in this country is heartbroken. Um, so I, I want to say, please do not forget Myanmar. Please do not forget our country. Like you are gonna see a lot of images there. Just try to look into the eyes of the people. Like especially the lady who was holding her, her granddaughter on her arms. Like you know, this image kind of you know came into me in most of the situation. You know. Um, so yeah, if you see into their eyes, you you will be able to feel it. And please deliver our message. And no, please feel free to ask uh, any questions to us. Please let us know if you need um, any any information. Also, uh, I want to share more about uh, like what I have seen, what I've experienced along the border. So that was uh, last year in Zimbabwe. Uh, the military has done airstrikes in Korean state. So it was uh, like like third week of uh, December. And thousands of people are like fleeing towards uh, uh, Mesa. So we have seen people, uh, how to say, there's uh, a single identical point that I noticed among all those uh, survivors of the war, which is, uh, their faces are like this, like, like their faces are like swollen. You know, first, so there was one of my friends like, who was one of the survivors. I, I asked him, you know, what, what happened to your face? And he didn't, look on, he didn't notice it, you know. And then, after I see more and more people like him, it is an identical point in their face. Like, they suffer like a big amount of trauma, and they slept on the earth, you know, without any shelter, you know. And uh, there is another thing uh, that I noticed. Um, I am so grateful uh, to have Thailand as uh, a neighboring country of Myanmar, my country. Uh, we have received uh, so many help from the local community along the border. Many Thai families, Thai local families, are cooking for Myanmar refugees, delivering aid supplies to Myanmar refugees. They have been driving, they have been helping uh, the migrant, Myanmar migrant community along the border to deliver all these aid and medical supplies along the border. So we embedded with them, uh, and then we drove to the border, uh, and then we, we saw like how they were uh, uh, helping. Uh, there are Thai monasteries, uh, Thai families, even Thai factory owners who let their uh, labors to uh, help the Myanmar refugees. You know, you can take a few days off, like or maybe a day off, to to help the the, the refugee community. You know, so today I really want to deliver a message that I sincerely uh, appreciate uh, Thai people as a good neighbor. Um, In terms of the survival situation along the border, there are many difficulties for the, uh, for the refugees. Uh, of course, their location, their current location, kind of mitigated uh, the risks that they faced in Myanmar. They were able to uh, flee from the Burmese military, but they also still faced a certain risks because they are undocumented. And, uh, and there are uh, some potential options for relocation. But the process is very slow. Uh, I kind of understand the situation that all these organizations are getting busy helping the people along the border. Uh, but there are thousands of people stuck in 
like you know some locations like they cannot go. Up. I mean, uh, we're talking about uh, those who were already who already got approval for the uh, for the uh, relocation. Um, not an expert. I'm um, just a uh, you know, uh, I, and I don't represent any organizations. Uh, I'm just on my own. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, uh, convey uh, what I have seen. Um, also, I'm not an expert, but I can feel that um, these people need immediate help. But if they still, if they continue stuck in uh, this situation, there are a lot of uh, consequences. Um, well, some might have to some people might have to return back to Myanmar. In this case, they will face arrest or even death. Uh, you don't know. Um, also, uh, there there are like many traumatic events uh, that they face. You know, they have nothing to do. They cannot go out. They stay in a you know small room. You know. Uh, there are even like fear just to go out and buy errands at 7-Eleven, you know. People are even afraid to go out to 7-Eleven uh, uh, along the border. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, their risks were mitigated because they could be able to flee from the, the, the police hunter. So, uh, in conclusion, my point is, uh, please don't forget my country, Myanmar. Now I feel like we are kind of forgotten, uh, and uh, and those people along the border need immediate help. Uh, and my my last message will be like I do really appreciate uh, Thailand and also uh, 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 people along the, the the local Thai families along the border as they've been helping a lot to uh, uh, our people fleeing uh, the war. Thank you very much, everyone. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Now, Al, first, and then, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm La. So I'm a journalist in uh, in Bangkok. I cover Thailand, Myanmar, Asia. Um, I was also a media teacher. So after the coup in Myanmar. We created uh, with young Burmese journalists this media, Visual Rebellion Myanmar, and we do um, feature research, documentaries, photo exhibition, and, and this one. And we continue the media, media training, which was interrupted like all education by the crew because uh, it's, it's young people who have been plunged into. Um, terrible situation and they didn't even finish the, the studies, so this is not the first thing you do usually as a, as a journalist. <clears throat> so we try to accompany them so they can still safely report. Um, so I will just describe our contribution to this exhibition, which comes from three places, uh, from different people, from our collective. Um, so first, it's the it's picture from the refugee camp in Mela in Tak province. Um, so Patrick explained this is this is one of the camp, um, the nine camps along the border that comes from the mid 80s. Uh, so the aim at the time was to offer shelter to thousands of thousands of people who had to cross to Thailand already for decades ago. So um, in Karen and Karen estates, some parts are at war for 60 years, and these people are here for 40 years. Um, some other persecuted ethnic groups actually have arrived recently in this camp. So it's the biggest on the on the Thai border, dozens of thousands of people, and um, we met the children there, no? So we we spoke to them, and uh, they speak Karen, but they don't speak Burmese. They speak a bit of Thai, a bit of English. Um, so I asked them, where do you come from? And they say, Mela, Mela. Nothing behind them, this is all they ever known. Three generations of people have only known this camp. They don't even remember where the parents or the grandparents come from. There is no transmission. No? It's just they are born there and they can stay there all their lives. Um, and um, so they, 
that should explain they don't have the status to go out to walk or, and they cannot go outside in school. There is some schools inside of the camp. Um, the funding has been very cut off, actually, paradoxically, when the political situation got better. Uh, in Myanmar, uh, around 2010-15, international agency Thailand said, oh, it's fine now in Myanmar, these people don't need money anymore, they can go back to their country now, so the funding kind of dried up. Um, and then the coup happened, and the needs are so immense now, that um, there is a gap between what people need and the money that's actually there. So the, in the old camps, people are, are really the, the forgotten people of this Exodus. Um, so, um, Patrick mentioned there is 90,000 people officially in these nine camps. Uh, ten years ago, actually, it was double. It was 160,000. And so, what happened in these ten years is that most of these people, uh, some of went back to Myanmar, but many have been resettled. So, at the, the UN agency in charge of refugees. Uh, they identify people who fit criteria. You have to fill the paperwork, and then if you are, if you fill the criteria, you are given a chance to go mostly for them to the U.S., Australia, New Zealand. Um, so the, the UN consider a refugee crisis in the world. There is three options now: you resettle people in another country like that, U.S. and Australia or you accompany them going back to their native land, but this is not possible for Myanmar people, uh, or you help them resettle in Thailand, which is not possible either because of the lack of status. So the only thing is this resettlement. And actually I wanted to say something about this because it's seen as a, as a privilege. Now we say to Karen people, oh, you can go to America. But actually I met a lot of people who have no really don't want to go to America. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I, not everyone sees a winter in Minnesota as a one lifetime chance, you know. And, and there was a, I met a woman in, in Melson maybe se seven, eight years ago in a, in a refugee camp which was really empty. Most of the people in this camp have been sent to New Zealand. And it's a camp that was is, um, mostly inhabited by this ethnic group where women wear neck rings. So she was explaining to me, uh, all my family has gone to New Zealand, um, but you know when they go there, they have to take off the neck rings, they have to put them clothes, they have to learn English, they have to find a job. And, and she said, why would I do that? No, it's, it's like there is no way. Um, to have such another experience of displacement because it's a second displacement, especially for all the people who have no way to integrate into such a different society. So all of this to say that um, most refugees in the world have like, free option. In, 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 in Thailand, the Miss people have one option and this option is, is not a choice. Uh, they should have the freedom of choice, no? with respect to the identity, um, dignity. So um, the, um, the second place we covered is about the, this current crisis. So um, it's somewhere along the border, it was during the dry season, uh, and um, we only show this picture now because these people are not there anymore now, because they were taken in April. And um, after what happened, there was airstrikes, especially at this um, place. Um, and the men soon came, so the banks of the river burst, so people cannot stay there anymore. So they have retreated further into the hills, and now it's extremely difficult to, to reach these people that we see on the, on the picture. At the time, during the dry season, it was only a few meters away. From Myanmar, you can see Myanmar, you can talk to them now, and now they have retreated further, and the access is made really difficult by the airstrikes and the monsoon. Um, and finally, the third chapter of our contribution is about um, food being uh, made on Thai soil by people, Myanmar people living in Thailand, but also Thai people, as, as both uh, my colleagues explained. 
uh, along the border in temples, in villages, a lot of Thai people prepared food and they brought this across the river. Uh, so we wanted to show this, this people solidarity and also the, there is two points here. Because humanitarian aid on an international mass scale level is not allowed to pass through Thailand, um, it's only this, it's only Myanmar people who have a bit more than the one inside and we take some of the wage and make food and send us. And uh, this is the only people uh, refugees can rely on, the own people living here. Um, and the second thing is that you can see that there is a disconnect between people's solidarity on the ground, villager helping villager, Thai helping Burmese and being together on the ground, and uh, this connect with the government, what's happening at the top, the real politics at the top. Uh, so it's important to see uh, the two sides, the people side and what's happening here and how we bridge this, this gap. Um, so it's not a new issue, as we explained. It's one of the oldest cases of mass displacement in the world. Actually, it's 60 years. It is, it's in the same that Palestine is well, it's the same length. Um, but it's a story which is getting bigger and bigger because the situation in Myanmar is worsening by the day, and people simply will keep trying to come to Thailand no matter what. So we can, on a humanitarian basis, we're talking about dozens of thousands of people who are trapped in a very small patch of land in the jungle at the border. And this is um, inferno, no? It's as, as strikes, hunger, disease, floods, and they have to flee the village with a shirt on the back. You have many pregnant women who lost their children on the way, quite free. Yesterday, just yesterday, um, one teacher, one Myanmar teacher, 25 years old, she crossed the river to Thailand with her husband. She lived a child with the family in Kaya State. And when she arrived in Thailand, she um, and she crossed because she's striking in her own country. She refused to walk school under the home class. She came to Thailand and she's chased by Thai police and she panicked and she jumped in the river and she died. And this was yesterday. One woman who just wanted to come here and teach and and this is the very concrete human consequences and I don't think it's justifiable in any means. Um, so if people are not offered an official safe way to seek shelter, they will continue to come, but at the mercy of human traffickers, as Patrick explained. So the same thing will happen, but illegally, and they will have to pay 15 to 20,000 bucks per head. Take one to one, everybody pay 20,000 bucks. So this is just um, an immense sum of money, illegally, goes into traffic pockets that could go somewhere else, probably, because people will spend the money anyway, so that's what this um, So yeah, we can all see what is happening. They are news, they are picture, people are testifying um, and begging for help. So there is, yeah, um, a need of a regional level solution to this endless escape, exodus, as, as what they are called it. Um, because there is no justification to let this happen anymore on such a massive scale. So, thank you very much for your attention and your interest. Thank you, And now, Mark, please put the last photo, please. Yeah. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming here. So, my name is Yana Yao. I'm the photojournalist. Uh, I just came here like a, a nine months ago. And that time that I just, the double was once again when I was came here, it's just a recent year, what happened in the country today. So, yep, uh, it's just kind of three weeks after the year, what happened. So I came here and I uh, just, just go there with a long word or something. And then I saw things again and we were suffering a lot. So, yeah, I'm just take some photo as a record. So, yeah, uh, all these things that that has been mentioned by Al. So yeah, uh, I just want to share the one of the story that I just met with a guy who is a farmer of the micro school. 
But in the previous year, it's just a migrant school, you know. But now it's just it's migrant plus the refugee school, you know. So after the two and the extra happened, so all these family came to the Thai side and then their kids at the level of the education. So he provide school. So and also in the other, uh, as I talked with him, he said that uh, when the Israel happened, uh, he has a lot of things to do for the, from his community, you know. So in that time, the, they all just cross the river with empty handed, they just only have one girl. So that time, I would say that he, he said that that time was like, he was totally shocked. So, that when he saw people and he said, and how, how can I have all these people? You know? So, yeah, he gave some shelter for the temporary and some food. And he introduced me with one of the refugees. So, that refugee shared his experience about, about the event that he faced. Yet he, along his family, survived from the strike across the river. So, so in that day, is the, uh, they just moved from one village to the another. And then, in the early morning, there is a conflict that happened down the area. And in that time, it was like his wife and the young daughter is on one place and he is with Shanta's daughter with another place and her, uh, his son was in that another place so it's kind of like a three place and what the conflict start happened they don't know how to communicate each other you know? so he was in the and he was quite close to the river so in that time that he is prepared somehow to help the people to cross the river in that time that he is searching, searching his wife and his daughter and stuff and all these, you know. So in that time that he didn't saw any of them, but that in the evening after the whole day happened, it just stopped happening from the early morning around 7 a.m. Uh, and he met with his family, family again at the night around according to him, he said that at the 8 p.m. So it's kind of like during the whole period, you know, you don't know how to describe his emotion and how he has been thinking about what if my family has been dead, died or maybe during the airstrike or the bombing during the conflict. So yeah, and then he said that even when they are crossing the river, the, the refugees are already arrived in the Thai side. There is a one rocket just crossed and landed next to the camp. So he said that. I was totally sure. What if that rocket hit to the camp? There's gonna be a thousand of people gonna be dead in that time. So he said. Uh, after that, I met with him and I listened all these things, emotional things that he said. So for now they are living in the Thai side and they are doing some sort of work for their because so yeah. So a lot of people stay like them currently living along the border. So and most of the you know, some of them receive some to supply from the local community, some international community, whatever. But some of them doesn't even receive any support or any help from them. So please help our people who are inside the conflict, you know. They didn't they didn't they didn't want to leave their place. But they have been also I mean they couldn't stay longer than for their life. If we if they want to stay at the they're gonna be there anytime. So they have no choice. 
So when they cross the river here, if they don't have any support, how do they will survive? So please, I just want to request on the Nigerian community and the local community, please help them. Not only the people, as you can see on your own eye, there will be a lot, plenty of people stay, stay there, there, but nobody doesn't notice it. So please find out, and if you need any facts or data about that, as you can feel free, feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the speakers for giving both the factual information as much as also the human story and really making very vivid what is happening. I open the floor uh, for everyone who has question or comments. I think I will take three first. If there are three. Who wants to ask or comment? Okay, one, two, okay, first, please. It didn't come up in any of your presentations, which are rich and appreciated, but just uh, any observations on recent uh, reports on TNR, transnational repression, authorities under various disguises uh, being in Thailand seeking to pursue certain individuals. Or fear from the uh, hi, Pat uh, Patrick. Uh, a question for you, really. Um, could you talk a little bit about the status of the Refugee Convention and the fact that uh, Thailand hasn't ratified it, and whether there's any move to push Thailand to ratify that convention, or whether viewed as a pointless exercise. Any other question? Last question for this time? No? If so, oh yeah. Phil? Uh, my understanding is that there's now more than a thousand people who are actually uh, awaiting your settlement uh, at various different spots on the border, uh, so-called IOM hotels. Um, can you tell us what the morale and the situation is with, with those group of people? Because our understanding at this point is that the Thai government has essentially stopped all uh, departures of Burmese to third countries. And, uh, you know, these people are, at, some of them have been waiting more than a year, uh, expecting to go any day, and nothing's happened. Okay, please, uh, this time for public. Thanks for your questions. Um, I can't really say much about transnational oppression because I haven't documented it. Uh, we haven't documented it. It's difficult to document, obviously, because it would happen in the shadows. But, you know, I think what we can say is, um, I think we can say with pretty much certainty that, that there is Myanmar military intelligence, as well as a lot of other intelligence organizations uh, who are active in the, in, in Mesop, particularly in the, in the biggest city along the border. Um, but as I said, I haven't documented that directly, and so I would be able to, like to, to say more. But saying that, I mean, what has been documented across the region is repressive regimes uh, working together to hunt down each other's dissidents. Uh, we've seen that between Thailand and Laos, between Thailand and Cambodia, between so it's a definite possibility, and I think it's something we should be on the lookout for, is you know, targeted um, assassinations or targeted disappearances of, of particular individuals, uh, Myanmar individuals on Thai territory, and we, we definitely uh, you know, welcome any information that others have about that. Um, uh, but as I said, we haven't documented directly. Maybe I'll just take the second question whilst I still have the mic. Um, Thailand hasn't ratified the convention, the refugee convention. Um, Actually, it's not the by doing this, this national screening mechanism, I think it's actually pushing Thailand even further away from ratifying the refugee convention because it kind of gives it an excuse. It, it, it's saying we have our own system that we are, we are abiding by 
international law, look, we are abiding by the refugee convention anyway. We don't have to sign this piece of paper to say that we have this long-standing humanitarian tradition of welcoming refugees and treating them uh, correctly. But we know, obviously, that that's not true, and we've documented that that's not true. Thailand has broken international law. Regardless of Thailand's uh, status under the refugee convention, there are elements of international law that are um, uh, that all states are obliged to follow, including the principle of non reform uh, and we've documented the Thailand. Uh, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, yes, this is a very important uh, and a hot topic uh, right now among the uh, exile uh, community. Um, well, I don't have any accurate information about those kind of uh, infiltration, but this is uh, very. This is to be very careful situation. So, like, uh, there were also other events uh, in the history. Uh, after the match, uh, a current leader was assassinated by uh, Burmese military intelligence, uh, like in the uh, test takings, right? So. I don't know if like, this could happen, but this is uh, to be uh, very careful. Uh, and uh, there is also another thing uh, that I want to highlight about in, in this, this kind of infiltration, which is uh, so now we have like a group of people called defectors. Uh, I'm friends with uh, many defectors. You know, I've been calling them, you know, uh, as well. So. I trust that most of them, I can feel that. Um, but there are more and more defections happening. Um, but I'm not sure if the, the, the new group of defectors are sincere towards uh, the people, like Myanmar people. You know, I don't believe uh, they, they defected because they don't like military anymore. You know, maybe they're scared of the you know, forcing uh, them to deploy in the front line, you know, because, I, I mean, I'm sure, like, my soldiers are, like, pretty much scared, you know, like, the whole country uh, turned up against them, you know, so it's scary, isn't it? Uh, so there is a new group of defectors, so we have to be very careful with that, but they are also, I, I still appreciate uh, many sincere defectors, you know, uh, uh, you know, who have joined the revolution. But but let me also highlight another thing. I almost forget, sorry. Um, and there, there is a, a new war that Myanmar people develop, which is called watermelon. Uh, so watermelon is outside green, but inside it's red, you know? Uh, and it's kind of like how creative we are, isn't it? Um, so um, there are also many watermelons uh, inside the military. Uh, and there are many of them, they want to defect, but their family members were forced to be in the, in the barracks, or you know, there are some situations as well. But my point is, like, of course, we have to be careful with you know, like the new uh, group of defectors. And in reality, there are many, many defectors who took breaks, you know, traveled for many days, spoken out against the Honta, uh, you know, and some of them still remain there, their, their, their families uh, in the country. Yeah. And uh, uh, if I can go back to Phil's question, uh, like how is the moral of the people uh, stacking the IO facilities? I think like the biggest, uh, the, if, if I'm in a such kind of situation, let's that, imagine, maybe like most of us have like recently been into uh, two weeks quarantine, three weeks quarantine during the pandemic. So they are also sort of in a quarantine. But and they, they don't know how long the quarantine is, you know. So this is the moral of the situation. I have been in three weeks quarantine once. It really made me depressed, you know. Although I had like all the facilities from the hotel, like food and everything, you know. I mean, of course, the island facilities also provide food. But the recipients at those hotels still face uh, a lot of uh, uh, traumas. You know, they are family members that are inside the country, or like they have family members in the prison. Or like they might already lost their family member, you know. Their 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 traumatic wound has to be healed immediately. 
you know, uh, to get this, uh, how to say, kind of uh, traumatic treatment, you know, they need to be in a safer place. You know? But there are some organizations who can offer this like online remotely. But you know, since you are in an uncertain situation, you feel uh, you cannot be positive at anything. You know, I feel as that uh, there are more than like one thousand people, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, my answer. Thanks. I will just add something for, for your question. The, the people, friends I know, who are waiting for a long time to be resettled. As you said, some it's one year, the process, and there is no answer right now. Why, why it's not moving forward? And the people who have gone, um, I know some people who have refused just because it's too long, they, because they know that there is 15,000 people in front of them. Really, we are talking thousands of thousands of people who feel uh, paper, and they know that they are at the bottom of the pile and they, they give up, no? So the, in, in my small experience, the only people who, um, who did it at the, at the very beginning, when they arrived at the Lekoko in December 2021, it's people who have children who are very small, or six, seven years old, because these are children who have never been to school because of the COVID, of the coup. So you have seven, eight, <coughs> nine years old children who have never been to school in Myanmar. And, and for the parents, they, they feel um, this is not possible because it's so difficult to put them in, in Thai school. Um, so the only reason why they feel the resettlement paper is to give a chance for them children to start school. Um, and for the one who um, were waiting, yeah, it's, it's months and there is no answer. And for all of them, it's, um, it's a trauma. One interesting thing too is that the people who have gone, that I'm still in touch with in the US, so, um, we, we think they are all sent to New York and have a great life. And no, actually, the, most of refugees are sent in places, empty states, or ghetto people where well, local people don't want to live, no? So you feel a place that are empty uh, in New Zealand, Australia, and, and the US, and they were not totally ready to be put in a, um, in a ghetto in the middle of Minnesota with a bit of English, and it's like, wow, um, this was not, we don't tell them, no? All of this was what it is, that the West is not all like Paris, New York, middle city center, no? So um, I think it's, um, yeah, people go for their children to go to school and that's the only reason, uh, I would say, and they, they swallow the frustration and the, and the shock of the displacement. And the one who, who gave up, they try somehow to make their life in Thailand. And it's also amazing the, um, that some Burmese people, they create their own school, no? and uh, you have money, uh, many schools that pops up from the ground just to take care of, of all these people. So there is hope and resilience and, and people take care of each other here. Yeah, not waiting for the savior to take them abroad. Mm. Yeah, do you want to add? Yeah, so... I just want to say about uh, yeah, as, uh, the art already mentioned about the how I was walking around, but maybe there's still a lot of people. Uh, such kind of a lot of people are waiting at the border to to get some sort of help from the environment or the international community. But it's kind of like the process is really slow, so. Even it's, it's like uh, some of the people that they already been submitted the register, submitted the form or the already register to get their help and support a uh, years ago, but even now they still doesn't have any receive any support or help. So it's kind of as we can assume that it's kind of really slow, or maybe just because of so many records or so many forms. So I'm not sure about it. So, yeah, uh, so, 
And whatever, if the reason is about being slow or just you couldn't have, it's quite not, not enough. So maybe, I think they should better uh, wash on the ground, maybe they will fast out, jump up the, the checking the process of it, you know. But the, honestly on the ground, most of the people really want this kind of help from the international community. They've been waiting and uh, every time this, I mean a group chat, you know, they've been asking for like, uh, uh, which day that we can take our food and supply. And in that time that even just one, one group, there are hundreds of people up there. Uh, so in one pre in one person account, the, he might along with his family or maybe, we don't know. Most of the people that every time when look so such in the first week of the every month is the, the food distribution week in the in that group. So after that week, everybody asking uh, when gonna be our terms. So a lot of question is they asking in that group. So it's such kind of like they need more help to survive here. Yeah. But the second and last round, Kim, please. I'd like to know if you could give us a breakdown of the caretakers, a breakdown of the caretakers of the Myanmar refugees across the border there. I mean, across the whole scene of refugees. I mean, there probably is no official accounting for who is taking care of refugees. But would you say from your experience that maybe half of the refugees receive just ad hoc local uh, assistance from villagers, and maybe the Thai government sees about 10% of refugees, or there are foreigners uh, who are officially um, who have visas which allow them to do this, or they have other visas which in which uh, uh, they're here for a certain purpose, but they also spend their time taking care of refugees. I mean, could you give us some kind of an idea of uh, the structure of the caretaking? Okay, I still, anyone also want to ask? This is the last round, yes please. Hi, this for Patrick. I would like to know any data that you have about human rights defenders on the border, um, any kind of difference or situation that they find when they are crossing the border, because they are highly, highly you know, targeted people. Coming back to the situation of the Miss Myanmar like two weeks ago, so just to pull up if you have any data on that. Thank you. Wait, there is one more here. I think Miss Myanmar got a lot of support. Including <laughs> Phil was helping my. Uh, okay, please. I don't have any question, but I wanted to add in the situation and share my experience. So, uh, long time ago, I used to work as the refugee camp as a teacher, and then I moved to Thailand and to trying to help the Burmese migrant worker. And then after that, I went to US. I met a lot of the refugees who were there. But many of them, they don't want to be there, you know, yeah, because it's very hard to be in somewhere else without your country. And with a new uh, culture and new language, they don't know any English. They don't have very high education, most of the rich people are in the third country. So for them it's very difficult to start a new life. Even though they have a health problem, they go to hospital. They cannot. They cannot even take a bus to go to, to send their children to school, right? So, but my other country, they may have very good support, but especially in U.S., I met them in the Auckland in uh, San Francisco area. So 
this is very difficult. And I met a lot of the uh, senior people. They are very, very lonely. <laughs> Their life is very difficult. So whenever I am, I'm talking to them, they said, I want to go home. I, I don't want to be here. Sorry. So, so I work at the, with the hospital as well to take them to the hospital and translate them and then send them to get the help like a, a social support and then so try to help them. But after my country, uh, after 2010, there is a change. So they open up. So I came back to to Burma. I live in Burma, but I'm thinking because I'm saying not enough education to uh, work more, to support more for my country. So I went back to prepare myself to get my bachelor degree, master degree, PhD degree. So now I just uh, almost graduate from my PhD program in Chulalongkorn University. But I'm thinking that after I finish my university, I will go back and to help the country. But even though I'm ready right now, but I cannot go back and be in the other part of to the uh, country. But we try to help. But what I want to say is don't think like all the refugees, they are coming here and they want to go to the, the that country. They are not. They want to go home. They want to be at their place where they belong, where they have a land to grow vegetables and to raise animals and to have their family. So please help not only support to give them food because give them food, just give them food is not enough to to for them to go back where they can live happily in the country. You know, other country they can they can do a lot of things to support to ask your government to to give the pressure or stop them, stop supporting the military government. You know, military government they don't care about people. Even everybody leave the country, only them, they, they can survive because they have a lot of natural resources there. They can get money, they can support the family. They don't care about the people. So a lot of young people leave the country. Where you live in Thailand and in Korea, Japan, it's very sad for Burma. You know, when the country open up, and a lot of young people, including me, we want to support and rebuild our country to be brighter. But we lost the opportunity. So please, try to give the pressure to the government and stop supporting gun or oil or government, the military government business. So please, help us to stop that. Thank you. We start with Jan. Yeah, I have no comment on it. Maybe I'll pass to you. Well, uh, if, if I can take your question, like, um, well, I think it is the time to uh, apply uh, more resources to any organizations or any agency that are working along the, the border, I, I think so. Because um, um, I'm like trying to be like choosing the word uh, carefully. Um, how to say? As someone in the field, I see the gap between the like, decision makers, especially in the international agencies, to be honest. Uh, there is a gap between the executive level and the people on the ground. There is a big gap that, that uh, we didn't notice. Uh, and that added more trauma and more trouble to uh, people like, suffering. Um, uh, I will 
will try to answer with some stories. There is an undocumented uh, pregnant woman uh, at the border. It was in the night. Uh, uh, she had an abortion, so she called her husband, who is my friend. Uh, actually, uh, he's also a journalist. Uh, anyway, um, so some of you have seen his story. Right? You know, maybe you might remember uh, this. Anyway, so he, his wife had an abortion. He called the hospital, uh, but he didn't. Uh, they didn't receive any help. I mean, they were not calling to a, a government hospital, you know. Um, so there are like kind of limits, you know, like what we can say, what you know, what not. I'm sorry, like and it's been being tricky. But I also really want to deliver the message. But there are also some kind of uh, limitations, you know. So I want to say there is this gap. So we have to fill this gap like as soon as possible. And also, there are many uh, experts and many international organizations. Whenever they want to help Myanmar people, uh, they go to the border and they stay there for like two, three days, and then they leave. It's not going to work. So spend time. Let's spend more time with us. If you, if you need more information, please let us know. Uh, you know, we are always available to to to, to help. Um, there are many. Uh, good contents uh, as well. Sometimes, you know, like, let's say, I, I'll give you an example, let's say, uh, let's say I'm a, I'm a Canon user, I always want to use Canon camera, you know, it, it's in our nature of, of human being, you know, we always want to uh, attach to whatever in the system that we used to have or whatever the brand that we usually have, you know, so, but now, let's try to think outside of the box, because uh, Myanmar military is much more cruel than every human being can imagine, uh, you know, and they have like all the extreme uh, crazy tactics to uh, tackle all of us. Uh, so that's why the trauma and the suffering of Myanmar people inside the country and also along the border, it's more than a lot. I recently finished a documentary about um, Myanmar uh, protesters, like who were beaten up, violently cut down, or even killed, you know. So that the amount of trauma in their mind is unimaginable. That we we cannot uh, imagine. So that's why I want to say let's apply more resource. Let's try to think outside of the box. And uh, and please spend more time with us. You know, not only two three days, but like come to the border uh, more than you can, you know, uh, maybe like, there are like many journalists that we admire here and many uh, experts, many researchers, I mean, I hope that all these, our friends can deliver this message, thank you very much. Interesting questions. Actually, both interestingly draw on the issue of data. Just to say, you know, I think that one thing that is quite apparent in both the Thai context and the Myanmar context is that, likewise, I mean, obviously they're not, not on the same scale. But oppressive governments, um, they don't want to know that kind of those kind of figures. You know, they, they silence those kinds of figures. Like we, we have the, the, the AAPP, the, the, the Myanmar organisation that is counting casualty figures um, since the coup. But that is a vast underestimation of the amount of people killed by, by the junta. Likewise, the Thai government doesn't really want any attention, uh, international attention especially, on the situation of the border. And so, you know, um, part of that effort is to, uh, they also have prevented UN agencies coming into uh, the border areas. They, they prevented actually plenty of local NGOs as well from, from providing aid, even though that they are really ready and willing um, to provide aid. I spoke to many groups based in Mesa, um, and there are plenty of, there's a, there's a whole community, many years, uh, uh, they've been providing services, both on the Thai side and the Indian part side, humanitarian services, and they really want to help the newcomers, but the Thai military and the Thai government 
to stop them from doing that. Uh, they let in maybe a handful, um, but they're under really strict conditions uh, when they provide aid uh, on the border. Um, they can't have logos on their cars or their, or their supplies. They can't fundraise for that particular effort. They can't publicize that effort uh, in any way. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the Thai military is really intent on uh, controlling that situation at the border. Uh, and they're playing politics with human lives uh, in this situation. And it's really, it's really sad to see, especially uh, there's a lot of comparison between situation in Myanmar and situation in, in the Ukraine. And sometimes that's helpful, sometimes that's not. But I think what we can draw a comparison to you know, between those two situations is the way that the countries surrounding Ukraine opened up their borders, they let the UN in, they let aid agencies come in, and they, they implemented the humanitarian action plans that the UN has across the world. Why is Thailand not allowing the UN to do that in this situation? Why is Thailand playing politics with this situation when the country bordering Ukraine did and they, they wholeheartedly embrace the refugees? Um, so I'd just like to bring that up. Um, on, on the specific questions, um, aid groups, uh, the breakdown of caretakers, there's plenty. There, there, there's, there's aid groups, there's UN agencies, there's the Thailand Border, uh, the, the border consortium, which has been there for many years, kind of an umbrella uh, coordination group. Um, there's IRC, there's, 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 there's NRC, there's plenty of, of aid groups there. There's also, as has already been mentioned, um, villagers who have taken it upon themselves to provide food and aid of various kinds, and that's really heartwarming uh, to see. In terms of the data on human rights defenders, well, I think that um, one thing that the Myanmar junta probably didn't want, or well, definitely didn't want, uh, and, and but what we've seen is an explosion of the number of human rights defenders um, in Myanmar. Uh, because anyone who stands up against oppressions and stands up against abuses is a human rights defender. And uh, now what we've seen since the coup is people from all walks of life uh, standing up against oppression, standing up against the hunters, terrible, terrible atrocities and abuses. So there's you know, it's hard, it's hard to quantify because the number, the, the, the number in, in itself is, has gotten so large. But uh, since the coup, Port of High Rights has um, helped to facilitate various kinds of uh, protection grants and assistance uh, to human rights defenders. And we've raised, I think it's more than half a million dollars. And we're a small organization, 20, 20 something people. Um, so, you know, that's, it gives you the scale of. We can't reach everyone, but we've managed to reach hundreds of people uh, with hundreds of thousands of dollars um, because that's the need. Unfortunately, now we're seeing a, a depletion of that money. Uh, you know, it's being diverted to other situations: Ukraine, Afghanistan, um, and so we're, we're we're having to change track and change our strategy a little bit in terms of you know, how we support human rights defenders uh, and rely on other forms of protection, including um, resettlement. And as as you, you really uh, illustrated there, it's not it's not the uh, it's not the ideal situation for anyone actually. No one wants to end up in you know uh, in, a, in a foreign land, completely foreign land, uh, with no job, and, and no friends, and no family around. And that's really not the situation. But for some people, that is the situation that they have to uh, accept because of their security situation. I think that's the key thing that we face with human rights defenders when we're assisting them is, is security. Because they're not only a target for the junta, they're also unfortunately a target for the Thai government as well. Because uh, the Thai government doesn't want any criticism of the of the junta coming from from Thailand, so they they actively silence journalists, they actively silence civil society organisations, they actively silence human Myanmar human rights defenders based in Thailand. So um, security is a kind of a really key thing that maybe differenti differentiates assisting human rights defenders to assist the system. Uh, if, if I can add something about uh, human rights defenders uh, uh, along the border, um, um, how to say? There are many organizations uh, working on emergency support, and I want to highlight them now. Uh, emergency support on human rights defenders. Uh, so. I really want to point out that uh, the support that they require by the human rights defenders is not three months, it's not six months. You know, 
and there are uh, some kind of uh, uh, rules or policies that if you uh, uh, if you apply the kind of support after uh, three months of departure, uh, then you are not eligible. So those kind of eligibilities need to be amended. Some people do not have information right away, or some stayed in the jungle for months, you know, so they didn't have that kind of information. So I really urge uh, all these organizations to uh, amend on, uh, uh, on um, those kind of uh, policies, you know, that would be really helpful to the multi monitor defenders community. Uh, and the, the other thing is that um, I want to highlight is the definition of human rights defenders in, in this, this uh, crisis uh, time. Because many ordinary people in Myanmar, they have, they became, they, they, they have spoken out, you know, they took risks, they sacrificed their lives, you know, to protect the rights of other people, you know, uh, to represent, you know, to try to uh, speak out for others, you know. And, and I think then they are being human defenders. Maybe they don't have any human rights works background before the coup, you know, but after that, of course, they have human rights background. And they are under the risk because of their human rights related activity. So it doesn't mean that they don't have human rights background. So, so we also have to be like, we also should think about this as well. For example, um, uh, we talked about uh, the factors before. Uh, so I think it's my personal opinion. I'm not an expert again. Uh, I can be wrong. Uh, but I think, uh, so of course, these the factors belong to the military that had committed a lot of atrocities over the uh, ethnic indigenous uh, community. Uh, but after the coup, there are certain defectors, or like many defectors, they immediately defected the military. You know, they need some support, and they deserve it, I think. You know, as someone from the ground, I would like to say that they deserve it, but there is no opportunity for them, and they are, uh, uh, they are suffering. And there is one final uh, thought that I want to add, uh, uh, but that's not about human defenders anymore. Uh, <coughs> uh, and the other way that you can help uh, the uh, community right now is that there are many independent uh, media organizations. You know, you can subscribe to them. You know, you can donate them. Like for example, Frontier Nema. Like you can. You can uh, surprise Myanmar, you know. Then, then in this way, you'll be helping them. Or like Myanmar now, you know, or ELD, you know. There are many reliable, independent media organizations that are suffering right now, you know. And, and many Myanmar journalists along the border, we don't know how to apply uh, fundings. We don't know how to apply uh, grant calls. We have no idea about it. There are many of my friends. They. There, there was a guy who I, I, I filmed, um, he sold his wedding rings to invest on his newly founded news agency, which has been working constantly since the day he has founded. And this newly founded organization was destroyed because of the coup. And then they moved to the border. He took responsibility of all of his staff. And then they moved to uh, a border village, uh, which was later airstrike. So his new house was also <laughs> destroyed again. And then they, he, his journey always continued. And he is the same person who had a wife that had abortion. He is the same person. So there are many people like that. They don't know how to apply grants. They don't have information. You know, maybe we don't check on Google. You know. So, so you can share those information. You can subscribe to them, or like you can like in, uh, individually uh, send some kind of like donations to them. You know, this will be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. I think I don't need to add anything. I think the final words are very clear about uh, to think why what refugee are. I think even here in Bangkok there are many who don't qualify as human rights defenders, but because of the coup and because of the spring, and they left, and now they're struggling after the COVID visa is over, 
they don't have visa anymore, they cannot be tourists anymore, so they cannot be work visa, so they have to go out, try to become uh, educational visa study type, many of them are doing this if they can afford to pay 20,000, 30,000. There are many around us, so they are not only in the border, those are most rural villagers who go up and down from one side of the river to the others. Then there are the political ones, and then there are many young people all around us who are really struggling. And there is the other issue of the passport that after two years, three years may end, and they are not so eager to go to the embassy to renew it. So, uh, let's think indeed very widely about uh, the issue of refugee and solution uh, to refugee problem. I want to thank uh, all the photographer and the speaker who are with us with this catalog of the uh, exhibition. Yeah, so this is the catalog. Conversation, and you can also purchase the catalog, the uh, postcards, give a donation to support C Junction and the activity. We hope to screen uh, the documentary as soon as you finish the European tour, Europe first, uh, but then hopefully the C Junction will be able to screen it in Bangkok towards the end of October. So we look forward to continue working on Myanmar and also with our uh, photographer friend. Thank you very much for coming.